Welcome back. On Monday, we looked at whether or not life has morally neutral areas, those gray areas, areas in life where we make decisions that are not necessarily sinful or holy. Uh, And in that first episode of the week, ABJ 1846, Pastor John defines sin for us. He defines sin with Romans 3.23, saying, quote, Sin is first the disposition of the human heart to prefer human glory, especially self-glory, over God's glory, end quote. We exchange God's glory for something we prefer more. We sin by exchanging the glory of God with another glory. That's verse 23. Then verse 24 gives the solution to the sin that we must be, quote, justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, end quote. That's Romans 3, 24. This pair of glorious verses, Romans 3.23, Romans 3.24, one verse defining sin, the other defining God's response to that sin, holds the key to how we become unshakable people in this world. Uh, Those verses are, according to Pastor John, more important than 10,000 books written by man to help you solve your problems. So much so, Pastor John says, if you build your life on these two verses, make them the foundation of your life, you will be strong and stable in a hundred crises of life. That's the bold testimony of John Piper, who makes those very claims in today's sermon clip, a clip from a 1999 sermon. Here's Pastor John to explain. Verse 23 describes the universal need of every human being. And verse 24 gives the all-sufficient remedy for that need. These two verses are more important than 10,000 books written by man about how to solve your problems and make your future better. These are the words of God through the Apostle Paul, and they tell us about our true condition, and they tell us about what God has done to remedy that condition. If you will build your life on these two verses, if you will make them the foundation of your life, you will be strong and stable in a hundred crises. If you will put these verses and the truth of them at the center of your life, like the sun at the center of the planets of the solar system of your life, then this truth will hold the orbiting planets of all the concerns and aspects of your life in place. But if you allow this truth of Romans 3, 23 and 24 to begin to marginalize and slip out to the rim, say where Neptune and Pluto are out there, you know what would happen if the sun moved from the center to the periphery of the solar system. Everything would be destroyed. Everything would be in chaos. Everything would be confusion and perplexity and weakness, which is why so many professing Christians coast and amble through life, wondering why their lives are so strangely perplexed, so out of sync and out of kilter and out of order and and nothing seems to be working right. It's because the truth of this magnificent gospel that I'm going to try to articulate is not at the center anymore. It's not the The sun that's holding everything in place, it doesn't have the weight of gravity to pull all things. Something else is at the center. You should be asking yourself right now, what's that in my life? Something really grips me in my life. Something I come back to again and again and again. I go there in the morning and I go there at noon and I go there at night and it pulls on me. What is it? Verse 23 says that the universal need in the world of every person has to do with sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No exceptions, 
There's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We saw that from verse 18 of chapter 1 to verse 20 of chapter 3. And now he, he tells us a little something about this condition by saying, if you've sinned, your present condition is that you are now falling short of the glory of God. Literally, the word is, you are now lacking the glory of God. What does that mean? All have sinned and are lacking the glory of God. Does that mean that we were supposed to be as glorious as God and we fell short and didn't arrive at that divine glory and so we have fallen short? I don't think that's what it means. You weren't designed to be as glorious as God. The best way to put meat on the bones of this simple verse is to go back to Romans 1 and look at the discussion of glory in the context of sin and see what a lacking might mean in Romans. So if you notice in Romans 1, verse 18, Paul said... They are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Everybody in the world is a truth suppressor until God gets a hold of us. We suppress the truth in our sin, in our unrighteousness. And then look at verse 23. They exchanged the glory of God, of the incorruptible God, for an image. Verse 28. They disapproved of having God in their knowledge. That's a literal translation. They disapproved of having God in their knowledge. So the picture you get is that sin is a failure to embrace the glory of God and God himself as our highest treasure and make him the center and foundation and supreme value of our lives and thus to exchange that glory for some other treasure in this world and thus lack that glory as our treasure and thus bring great dishonor upon God. That's what sin is and does. Sin is mainly about God. It's not mainly about hurting people. Sin hurts people. Sin hurts people. It'll hurt you in the end. But it's not mainly about hurting people. It's mainly about God. And trading, bartering, throwing away His supreme Value and glory in order that we might put something else at the center and in the bank and in the treasury of our lives that we love and we lean on and we find satisfaction in. And thus he is belittled and despised, sometimes wittingly and sometimes unwittingly, with the same effect in both cases. Now, that's a great guilt. That's a great guilt. The reason it's a great guilt is because God created this universe, the whole universe, to display His glory. So that we might see it and value it and love it and enjoy it and reflect it in the world. That's why the universe and you were created. It should not, therefore, be surprising to us that the world will go haywire when the world is in rebellion against the design of the world. If God designed the world, according to Isaiah 43, 7, to display His glory, and you are choosing to dispense with his glory to put something else at the center of your life and love it and live for it and think about it and dwell on it and value it 
It's not surprising that the design of God for a beautiful, holistic world would be destroyed in your life. There is dysfunction and chaos and misery all over the world because the whole world is in rebellion against valuing the glory of God above all things. That's why the world and your life is in the condition that it's in. Sin is contemplating God as the supreme value and rejecting him as the supreme value. And thus exchanging the glory of God for some kind of substitute image. Think of what it is. And thus lacking the glory and thus dishonoring the glory of God. And that is a great guilt. And that's the universal condition of humankind in verse 23. It's a massive problem now that we have. And the problem is, since we've all done this, how can we get right with God when we have so belittled him? And that's what verse 24 is about. This verse is so rich. A great turn has come in Romans in verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Some great event has happened. Now, you hear that word now, but now, but now, some great event has happened. And something new is happening in the world. No other religion. No other religion knows of this great now. Because it's the now of the arrival of Jesus Christ and the redemption that is in him. So let's read verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Glorious truth, profound text, uh, and a high reminder. This clip was taken from John Piper's sermon titled God's Free Gift of Righteousness Part 2, which was preached on May 16th, 1999. Check it out on the site at desiringgod.org. God's Free Gift of Righteousness Part 2, preached on May 16th, 1999. If you have a sermon clip to share, email me. Give me your name, hometown, the sermon title, the timestamp of where the clip happens in the audio, and make a note of what stands out to you. Put the word clip in the subject line of an email and send it to me at askpastorjohn at desiringgod.org. That's our email address, askpastorjohn at desiringgod.org. Well, how do we learn to receive criticism from others? It's an important question. It's an important skill. And it's up next time. I'm your host, Tony Ranke, and we are rejoined again with Pastor John on Friday. We'll see you then.